time is we talked about adding, we talked about sort of a general flow of what you'd need to do. What I want to do is, first of all, see if you have any questions, and then, uh, if not, then, then talk about um, refactoring um, the code that we looked at last time. Um, I know one of us was out um, for a few days uh, for a while, so um, what, what there is is there's been an assignment we've sort of been working on as a cross between individual and in class. We've been working on a tic-tac-toe uh, program. And we got so far for it, and um, I, I typically what I've been doing is I've been talking about it like for the first segment of class, and folks can work on it on their own uh, in, the, in the second part. So just a simple tic-tac-toe. Um, and I have it in two-player mode uh, where you would just pass the thing back and forth, and another possibility would be to have the computer play against it. So we'll talk about um, that going forward. Now, what we talked about um, in a previous class, I think, if, I, if memory serves, was we talked about adding the um, on-click listener to each of the things. All right. The layout for tic-tac-toe will be pretty straightforward. It will simply be a table, uh, a table view that will have uh, three rows in it and three columns. And um, the three columns will be, they'll be in, in each, yeah? If I wanted something on the screen, it would be on the screen. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Well, at any rate, um, the, um, the, the, the layout will be a simple table view that will have three rows, and each row will consist of three image views. Um, each of those image views are going to be treated the same as far as clicking on, because if you think of the mechanics of the game, the mechanics of tic-tac-toe is that an empty space will be replaced by an X or an O, depending on whose term it is, turn it is. All right? And uh, another aspect of it is that when, uh, when, when a, a square has already been selected, it can't be reselected. So there's a number of ways that I could do this. And we talked about the different ways that you could apply a uh, on-click listener. We could create a separate class. We could um, create an uh, anonymous class. But what I did is I simply made the activity itself, the listener, all right, by saying that it implemented on click listener. Now, what does that mean to say that I've implemented it? It's an interface. To say I've implemented it means I have to follow the contract of the interface. And what's the contract of the interface? The contract of the interface is a on click listener uh, implementer has to have an on click event. So I put an on click event there. So I had code that looks similar to this. All right. I would have, I had nine image views declared as properties. Image view zero, zero, let's say. Image view zero, one image view 1 or 0 2 image view 1 0 image view 1 1 image view 1 2 image view 2 0 image view 2 1 image view 2 2 I did that to start and frankly I could leave it like that, right? Because tic-tac-toe, unlike many of my other applications, um, the, the, the rules are, are well-defined and they're static. In other words, there's nine squares in a tic-tac-toe. So I don't feel too bad hard-coding those, all right? But yet I still do feel bad hard-coding them, all right? So that's what we're going to talk about when we get into refactoring. I then have in the onCreate event for my activity, Something where I say I zero zero equals cast as an image view get view by ID and then I have the appropriate ID 
for that image view. Then I say add on click listener this. Why do I do that? I do that because again I've made the activity itself be the on click listener because each one of those different things I'm treating the exact same way. I'm coding the exact same way. Therefore, I can make this the on click listener for all of them. Now, I have the same block of code repeated nine times for each, or repeated eight more times. So, a total of nine times I have this block of code. All right? Now, nine isn't horrible, but nine lines, nine blocks of code repeated makes me worry what happens if I have to change something. What happens, what happens for example, if we said let's do a 4x4 four four tic-tac-toe game. Let's see how that would work. That's interesting. Have anyone ever played 4x4 four four tic-tac-toe? There's the game Connect 4. I know that. That is sort of like a 4x4. Four four. And you know what? I'm guessing by simply tweaking this a little bit, we could make a tic-tac-toe game that could also play Connect 4 if we wanted to, you know, where the checkers slide down uh, that. So, for a variety of reasons, some of them purely style, that this sort of goes against my grain as a developer, and for practical reasons as well, we might want to refactor this. So, how are we going to refactor this? Well, one of the things that you can do, anytime you talk about refactoring code, you talk about where you can create functions for things, where you can do things in loops, or where maybe where you can create a class for things to be reusable. All right, whole idea is reusing stuff, not writing it a bunch of times. DRY, do not repeat yourself, is the, the slogan of the savvy programmer. So in this case, we have blocks of code where everything's the same except for one little bit. And that little bit is the specific image view that we're talking about and the specific ID. So, let's go and take a look at what I did to refactor that a bit. First of all, here's a nifty trick. Some of you, like if you're working on different versions of the program, like sometimes I may have a tic well, like for example, I had a tic-tac-toe program uh, of my own, and a student turned in a tic-tac-toe program. Well, I already have mine in the workspace. I can import a second one named tic-tac-toe. What you can actually do is go in and switch workspaces. All right? So this is a different workspace, workspace two. And that allowed me to import the student's tic-tac-toe program without messing up mine. So that's a neat little trick. Um, if, if you go under file, there's a switch work uh, workspace. So I can then, like I, in this case, I brought in their tic-tac-toe program so I could check it and run it and all that and without having to worry about like deleting mine out of the workspace and re-adding it and so on. So I'm going to switch my workspace back to the regular one and hopefully everything is still intact. rid of this RPS part two. And I'm going to bring in the version of the tic-tac-toe that I was working on in class last time, the tic-tac-toe lecture. That was a version that I was working on that you'd see in the video. So I'm going to go and I'm going to import that guy into my workspace to show you what I mean. And what we have here is exactly what I described. 
namely, I have, well actually I don't, it's not exactly as I described because in class I only worked on the first row. So, what I have instead is I have one row's worth of cells. I have my image view I1, I2, and I3, and I have that block of code repeated three times. That only does the first row though. All right, so this is not really adequate for, this isn't a full-blown tic-tac-toe board, this is just one row. All right, yet it has all the behaviors that I needed. Namely, on the on-click event, what I do is I grab the image that got clicked, I see if it has been chosen or not. If not, I either set it to X or set it to O depending on whose turn it is. And then I flip whose turn it is by negative one. Notice also, and this is something that, that was done in the spots on example, is that I store the tag. I store something in the tag. The tag is simply a place for me to stuff anything I want to to identify this image view. So what I'm stuffing in here is I'm stuffing the resource ID for drawable X or drawable O. So later on I can check to see if it has been selected and if it has been whether it's been an X or an O. All right. Now, as we mentioned before, this isn't good from a programming perspective. All right. Because I have a block of code that's repeated six times, all right, or three times rather. I have two lines of code, total of six lines, two lines repeated three times. So what is the solution to that, probably? How can I streamline this? So I don't have to have, ultimately, nine blocks of two lines repeated. I'm going to use a for loop. And how am I going to use the for loop? What do I typically use for loops with? With an array. Right. Now this is actually going to be uh, what's called a two-dimensional array. All right. Which, if you think about it, a two-dimensional array is exactly what a tic-tac-toe board is. That is, it's not a list. It's a list of lists, if you will. So there are rows and there are columns. So I'm going to create a two-dimensional array. And then I'm going to loop through, and I'm going to assign each element of the array to a position, or I'm sorry, I'm going to assign each image view to an element of the array. So, how many of you have done anything with two-dimensional arrays? Okay. Well, just to quickly refresh your memory, a two-dimensional array would be a construct like this. Which, again, already should look like a tic-tac-toe board, right? And there are elements of the array, and we can define each element by, in the case of a two-dimensional array, two subscripts. That's what we mean when we say there's a two-dimensional array. You have to give two dimensions. You have to give two subscripts to identify a cell. So, for example, this is in the first row, the third column. Now, with array subscripts in programming, you start numbering with zero. So actually, this would be element, whatever my array was called, a sub 0, sub 2. And I would represent it that way. All right? Now, once I do this, my life is going to be easier in a bunch of different ways. One way my life is going to be easier is assigning the on click listener event. Because all I'll have to do is, once I've created this array, all I'll have to do is loop through and I'll have two loops, right? One to loop through the rows, one to loop through the columns. So I'll have something like for int j equals zero j less than, 
I'm going to hard code a 3 in here now for simplicity. J plus plus. And then inside this loop, I'll go 4 and i equals 0. i is less than 3. i plus plus. And then in turn, I can refer to the elements of my array, uh, my array uh, views, or my image views, rather. I can review, I can, can refer to each one as my array name, let's say it's IV, J sub I, and then I can assign the on click listener. to this. So as opposed to having nine statements of, or nine groups of, of two statements, or 18 statements, I can assign all the click on click listers in effectively three statements here, which is, which is pretty nifty. All right? All kinds of things happen good when you use arrays, right? You only have to get the instruction right once. You don't have to worry about cutting and pasting and messing up or anything like that. If you get the loop right, the loops right in this case, and that instruction right. Now, the other benefit that this would have is if we were to say, let's make a 4x4 four four tic-tac-toe game. Or even, let's make a three-dimensional tic-tac-toe game where you have three layers and you can get this way, that way, and the other way. Then all we have to do is tweak the array a little bit. We add another subscript in the loop and add another dimension to the array and another subscript to our array element, and we're in business. Oh, it just says IV, which is my image view array, sub J, sub I, dot set on click listener, this. This part? Yeah, that's, I started to write something and I, I squiggled it out. Go ahead. But you would have to make uh, the array first. Herein lies the rub. All right? And that's where, again, when I looked at this originally, I thought that that could be a problem. It's a problem because I didn't know how to do it, right? But that doesn't mean that someone doesn't know how to do it. All right? And here's the problem. The problem is, how do we identify things I have a line of code now that looks like this. I11 equals image view, find view by ID, r.id.cell1, or cell11. What is r.id.cell11? Is that a string? No, that's a resource identifier. And if we look here, we can probably even find it somewhere in here. It's actually some goofy value. All right? Who knows how it, assi it assigns it somehow. So that's not this line of code here, this is not a string that contains cell 1, 1. It's not a string that contains a L, uh, cell 1, 1. So our statement looks like this. Image view. The question is, is how do we get that ID resource pointer, all right, when all we have is the name of the cell? How do I construct that? In other words, how do I put this in a variable without doing any hard coding? 
Well, if we look at my if we look at my code here, we'll notice that in the layout I followed uh, a naming convention. And that is, the cell IDs are cell 11, cell 12, cell 13. Cell 21, cell 22, cell 23, and so on down the line. Now, if this were HTML, all right, I always hate when programmers say that. Boy, if this was only, but, okay, I did it, all right. I could do this. Comparable to the get view by ID, there's a get element by ID. And I could construct a string based on some variables like this. And it would find the thing that had the ID of cell 11 or cell 12, depending on the values of, of i and j. I can't do that here because, as I said before, this isn't a string. However, there's a way to create that resource ID from the string of the name of the ID that we want. And that's the secret to crack here. So, if I look I'll go in and open the one that I made the modification on. These two lines are the key. All right. What these two lines will do will be allow me to take a string that's the name of an ID and actually get that ID reference that I need here. So let's look at these two lines. The first one says string image ID equals cell plus I plus J. So what is that doing? I have a loop that starts I from 0 to 3, or from 0 to 2 rather, J from 0 to 2. So what I'm doing is as this goes through the loop, the first time through the loop I'll be referring to cell 0, 0. Second time, cell 0, 1. Third time, cell 0, 2. The fourth time then, it will be the trip through the second row. So it will be cell 1, 0, cell 1, 1, cell 1, 2. So this forms a string that contains the name of the ID that I want. I have to translate that name into the actual ID, and that's where the next line comes in. Int resource ID equals get resources dot get identifier I'm going to continue on the next line even though it's all part of the same line image ID and it in fact is an ID And the particular resources that I'm looking in is the resources for edu Lorraine CCC dot Zellers. In other words, this package. So what does this do? This takes a string that I formed up here dynamically 
and finds the ID in the resources for this package. So effectively, what it's going to do is it's going to look up in this table for cell 00 and find the integer ID that corresponds to it, which is this guy here. Now notice that one thing I did when I converted this to an array is I renamed all my cells. Instead of starting with cell 11, I started with cell 00 to keep it consistent with the array convention of the first row being row 0, the first column being column 0. So, still, even with a couple of extra lines of code that I had to put in, I replaced 18 lines of code with one, two, three, four, five, six lines of code, plus a couple of curly brackets. So even if you count the curly brackets, I'm still, still half the code. But, it, but it's better than having the code because I have less chances to make mistakes. Yes? No. Or is it just on? This just tacks on to our two-dimensional array. Zero is really zero zero. Right. Right. Exactly. So in other words, I grab that resource ID. Once I grab the resource ID and find that image view, I don't really need the resource ID anymore. So. The resource ID is just a variable that gets each iteration through the loop. It gets recreated over and over. All right, But I don't really need it for anything else because I have the actual image view in my array. And I populate my image view, or, or I create my image view array up here as being a two-dimensional array that has three rows, three columns. And I initialize it here. And then, after I grab it, I set the on click listener to that. So I've done in this one loop, I've done all nine cells. Now, if I decided I wanted to play um, a 4x4 tic tac toe game, all right, instead, I'd simply change the loop to go up to 4 instead of going up to 3. And most of the stuff should work then, all right? Uh-huh. Right. What do you mean, how would that look written out? Right. Oh, and in other words, how if we did it if we did it the other way? Yeah. So if we went past, if we went past the string, mm -hmm. the stuff it has cells, and then it has some type of string. Mm -hmm. Is the cells the beginning part of the ID? Yeah, the cells are the beginning part of the ID. If we look here at, yeah, if we look here in our layout. This is cell zero zero. This is cell zero one. Okay, so J is Actually I think J is the second. I is the first J is the second. Yeah, I is the first J is the second. And those values only Because I've looped through up to three. Right. Right. So in other words, the first time through the loop is gonna be cell zero zero. And then what I need to do is I need to translate that string into that resource identifier. And that's what this line does. This takes a string, it looks it up in the identifier section of this guy's resources. Yes.
Don't see where I'm parsing what? Well, this function returns an integer. Okay. These resource IDs, again, if we look in the generated resource IDs, the resource IDs that get created are integers. Okay. So we have to have a way somehow of translating that integer, I'm sorry, our string into an integer. And that's what this line does. This get resource one is the one that takes this ID, finds the resource that has that as the ID, and returns the integer value that we need. Okay, so, so the get constructor has a Well, it's not a constructor, but it, 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 it's a method. All right? Um, yeah, that's why there's three things. We have to say, hey, what's the value we're looking for? In this case, cell zero, 0, let's say, the first time through. What is it? Is it an ID, or is it a drawable, or is it a dimension, or what is it? Well, it's an ID. And whose resources? EDU, Lorraine, CCC, Zeller's resources. So what that does is that returns this number. All right? The thing that, that might not be clear that, was, that took me a second to, to realize is now we have that number, we can call this function and give it that ID. Hey, I was going to say, why didn't you set it? Why didn't I do what in the first place? Set it up with the function. Ah, but that's... That's the thing. Let's look at the first version of this that I did. Let's look at the one that we were doing in lecture. Now, you may say, hey, I'm putting a string in here. That's not a string. That is an integer. All right? What that is doing is that is pulling what? All right? It is pulling from my resources, and unfortunately I called the resource file something different, but it's pulling from com example tic tac toe lecture dot r, so it's pulling from this guy's resources id cell one one is pulling that integer. Okay, so the cell one one is the cell one one is equal to the yes. Yes, it, yeah, exactly. That's, that's sort of the tricky part, is it looks like this is using the string, the name of the cell. It's not. It's using the name of the cell to grab from the resource file the integer that's the true resource ID, and then doing it. Here, we're just getting that resource ID a different way. And... It's it, exactly. Fine view by ID needs an integer. Exactly. And let's see where. There we go. Yeah. So fine view by ID, yeah, needs an integer no matter what. It's just two different ways to refer to that. The difference here is that I can type out cell 1, 1. All right. And it'll, it'll figure that out. It, it knows that name. I can't give a variable name for a variable. So I couldn't say uh, r.id.cell plus i plus j. I have to go through this little intermediary step to convert that variable string into an integer, the integer that belongs to it. Other, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, this, that, that's the part that took a minute. And that, that's why, and it's funny, that's why... Um, as I was coding this, and I was duplicating the 18 things, I look, you know, or, or the statements nine times, I was looking at it and I said, yeah, I know there's a better way, but you know what? I'm just interested in getting the functionality work, so I'm not going to do that quite yet. And then sure enough, when I got to the point where everything else is working, it's like, okay, let's go back and figure that out. And I think that's a reasonable approach, because you don't necessarily want to leave it like that, the brute force method. But... To get over the hump, to get to test other aspects of it, sometimes you take uh, an approach that you know that there's a better way to do it, but this is okay for now, you know. And from like the practical viewpoint, you know, as a student, 
you know, if the deadline for turning it in was coming in, hey, the brute force method works. may not be as elegant. You might have to do a little bit more work, but hey, it works. And again, it's probably less of an issue here because I know tech-tac-toe typically is going to be 3 by 3, so I know that that's hard-coded. Yes? Yeah, that's an instance variable. No, I, I was looking at the lack of code underneath that, and I didn't see where you declared the, that array yet. So I was like, where, how does this thing know what ID is? Right, right, yeah. It's an instance variable. Again, this is something, if you think about it, you know, for a tic-tac-toe game, the board is something important. A lot of functions are going to need to refer to the stuff on the board. Right, so I made the board an instance variable. That that the board effectively is that IV uh, new image view. Probably an unfortunate um, choice of names because <laughs> things of an IV like with medicine, but uh, it, it, it was meant to be an abbreviation for image view. Now, now that I got it in an array, I can do all kinds of nifty things with it. Right, for example. If I am evaluating who wins, all right, let's think about that for a second. If I'm evaluating who wins a tic-tac-toe game, and I have my board, you win a tic-tac-toe game if a row has the same thing in it. You win a tic-tac-toe game if a column has the same thing in it. And finally, on the diagonal. The diagonal, I'm not going to worry about that right off. That's kind of an exception, right? I mean, I could hard code that one in and I'm going to be okay with it. I might be able to think of a clever way to do it, but yeah. I'm okay. I'm okay with hard coding the, the diagonal because there's only two of them. But what's my function to evaluate the board going to look like? I'm going to write it out, but I'm not going to write precise code. All right, I'm just going to write kind of like a pseudo code. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do something like this again. I'm going to have a lot of these loops in here for i equals zero i less than 3, i plus plus, for j equals 0, j, or actually, no. I'm just going to do this one. Again. Could I do a better job than this? Yeah, maybe. I don't know. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to look to say if cell i sub 0 and cell iv i sub 1 and cell iv one or i sub two all equal x then x wins if they all equal o then o wins so with one loop and a couple of this statements i can handle every row by changing up the, the loop up a little bit for i equals 0, i less than 3, i plus plus, if iv sub 0i and iv sub 1i and iv sub 
i. If they all equal x, then x wins. If they all equal o, then o wins. So with two little loops, I can handle one, two, three, four, five, six situations. I can then know and go in and hand code the two diagonals because they're kind of the oddball. If I thought about it long enough, I could probably write a cleaner solution for that. Right? There does come the point with refactoring where you look and say, how good does it need to be? How much better can I make it by doing that? And again, especially when you're talking about in, in a real world environment, you know, there's a point at which that any gain that you have in the maintainability or the, the performance or whatever of the code doesn't justify the cost it's going to take you to sit around thinking of it. So you're going to look and say, yep, that's good enough, all right. All right? Now, what about at the end of the game? All right. How do we know when the game is over? We know the game is over when someone wins or no cells are left. So we can test. And again, we just described sort of testing to see who won. We could see if there's any cells left. How? Well, with again, another loop. Instead of exhaustedly looking at each cell individually, we can loop through all those cells and we can say is, and again, in my case I'm using the tag, but I can say is the tag, you know, set to nothing for this guy? Is the tag set to nothing? And if there's at least one that's available, then the game goes on. If there's none available and no one's won, then the game is over. Or if someone's won, the game is over. And to reset the game then, what do I do? Again, I simply do the same sort of looping scheme where I loop through all the cells and um, set each cell back to effectively null. So I set the tell cell equal to x. And I simply loop through and set everything back to the unknown, uh, the, the question mark in my example. Now, other things that I could improve, I, could pr I probably could write a function to check to see if a cell is empty or not. Right here, here's where I'm checking to see if the cell is empty. If there is a cell that's empty. I could probably write this in a function. The reason I would write it in a function is, let's imagine this is not a two human player game, but this is a computer game. All right. Yeah. I guess, or, or yeah, when I go and make a choice, well, I don't know, maybe I don't need a function to do that. Because when I go and make my choice, well, I, let's, let's back up, actually, I do, right? Because the computer isn't going to be clicking on that. The computer is going to be making a choice, all right, manually. So, I might not make... Well, let me pose that question. I might not make a, a function for is the cell empty, but how could I change this on click event to work better when the computer is playing the game? Because the computers can't click on things. So how would I fix this to allow the computer to play against me? I use a random generator, all right? But how am I going to call this code? I guess is a question. Okay, so the human player is done making a move. Let's go and do this, all right? Who do we want to be the computer, X or O? Let's make X the computer, all right? So. 
I'm going to go here and We'll call a method for a computer's move. Okay. All right, how do I, what, what am I, how do I generate a random number for this? Int equals math.random. That gives me a double, right? So times three. All right, how do I convert that to an integer? Okay, there's I and there is J. So I have my two random numbers. I want the computer to put make its move on either uh, on that if it's available. So what do I do next? Let's, let's talk through logically what I need to do next. Well, why did I set two random numbers? Yeah, for the row and the column. Or for the, yeah. because I'm going to pick the image view uh, that way. Yes. Right. 
going to have to see if it has been picked yet. All right? And what if it has been picked? Then I'm going to do it again. All right? What if, so if it's been picked, all right, if it's been picked, I want to do it again. If it's not been picked, what do I want to do? Make the image to be the image for the computer player, which in this case is X. In other words, I want to do this function. Right? Because what does this function do? This function takes the image view that you pass it. All right? And it goes in and it sees if that has been taken or not. And if it has been taken, it disregards it. If it's not been taken, it will change it either to an X or to an O. And then it will flip the turn. So I, I want to do this, right? This function. All right? So, can I do this? I call that function. Sure, I can call that function. All right. But that's not going to repeat over and over again until um, until um, we have an empty square, right? So what I'm going to have to do is do something like this. I'm going to change this from being, ooh, I can change this from being a void, right? Because this is implementing that interface. Let me tell you what I wanted to do, and then let me, let me tell you why I can't do it. I wanted to change this to return a Boolean. And the Boolean would say, yeah, this move has been successful. In other words, the square was free. Or no, this has not been successful. In which case, it's not uh, a successful move. <coughs> the problem is, is, I have too much code on my click event. So what I am going to do is, I'm going to go and I'm going to break this out into a separate function. And that function is going to return a boolean. So I'm going to say public boolean make move. And I'm going to pass it an image view. And I'm going to create a boolean that says whether the move has been made or not.
if the move has been made, I'm going to return. I'm going to do I'm going to set that the move was successfully made. And then I'm going to return. The Boolean. So now, my code for this is going to say if make move B doesn't like that. Why? Because I have to cast that as an image view. Oh, lowercase m. So that does everything that the old click event did, except I've extracted the code from the click event. Why is it important to extract it from the click event? Well, because if the code's in the click event, I can't call it from anywhere else easily. Now, for the computer move, I can go and say, make move and I can put that in a loop do until make move if I remembered how to do an, uh, do until in Java Actually, yeah, I, well, let's see, do, I want to do,
Okay. So what am I doing here? Here, with the click event, I just essentially moved this code into this. And instead of having that code as part of the onClick method, I have a separate method that gets passed an image view and does everything it made before. Only difference is it now returns a true or false, whether the move is successful or not. All right? In this case, I've made the computer move, randomly pick something, and then it's going to try to make a move over and over again until it has successfully made a move. All right? Let's see if this actually works. do as long as it has not made a move. So in other words, I want to repeat this loop as long as I have not yet made a move. If I have made a successful move, I'm done. The move made will be true. So let's see if this works. And there we go. It, they made an X. Uh, now the problem is, is I didn't go in and tell it after it's done with, with that. So I have to go in and have to tell it to make the computer move. To answer your question, no. I, there's not a programming language in the world that I'm aware of that if you have a uh, a compile error, it will say, well, let's run the stuff that did compile. Uh, that's, from a programming perspective, that's, uh, that's a non-possibility. If you have a compile error? Um, no. I, I'm not following you. I don't see any difference in substance between what this does and what Visual Studio does. Well, if you get a compile error, you get a compile error, and it tells you. I mean, the, the, the verbiage of the error might be different, but... Okay. All right. Close and save. I mean, I, I don't follow the question. Here, look. Here's an error. Okay. I go, okay, I'm, I'm sick of this. Let me get out of here. All right. Let me go back in next day. Open that guy up. Okay. All right, go in here. Hey, I look, I got a compile there. Oh, okay. Has no idea what ASD, ASD, ASD is. I better get rid of that. <laughs> right. Well, yeah, of course it won't do anything because it has errors in it. Oh, 
open up the open up the source code. We'll go and open up the source code then. I guess is what I'm saying. How do you open up the source code in Eclipse? Okay, here I'm going to open up the source code in Eclipse. Oh look, tic-tac-toe package. Let me click on that. Source. There we go. No great trick there. At any rate, let me run this to see if the computer works in playing against me. All right. Ah, I have a bug. It's stuck. I'm not accepting that. I probably, I don't know. I'll have to take a look at it. At least did it for a couple of them, though. Computer move, computer move. Turn. I'll have to look to see what's going on. But at any rate, the key thing I wanted to focus on this is that by removing the code from the on-click event and creating a method for it, that um, made my life easier as far as this goes. As far as your question, I mean, you, you open the source code. The, you, you navigate through it. You open up your project. You click SRC. You find the object that you're interested in, or the class that you're interested in, and you go into it. I, I, I mean, you know, the look of Visual Studio and the features of Visual Studio are different, but this is programming just like it is there. I mean, it's, ex it's the, the, the concepts are all, I don't see any huge difference between the two in terms of principle. The way they look, sure, yeah, they look different. But, I mean, as far as like what they do, they do the same thing. You know, uh, a program in Visual, Visual Studio that you write, a C-sharp program that's compiler, ain't going to run anymore, and an Android app ain't going to run. I mean, it's just that simple. You know, the manner in which the errors are reported, the manner in which you navigate to it, yeah, that's all different, but you do the same thing in both. Um, I, I don't know what to, you know, I, I don't know what to say beyond that, you know. The, but yeah, you open the source up and you go in and it will show you. So if you leave, if you quit with a syntax error and you go out and you're done for the day, when you open it back up, it'll be there. And you can go in and, and clean up the air. All right. We'll see you up in lab.